We're all so pumped about the release of that Michael Jordan documentary. So how about we start by talking about the GOAT, Michael Jordan, because he recently said in an interview that after watching the footage back, he's worried about coming across as a horrible guy. It's also worth noting that MJ did have approval of all the footage, the final output of that documentary. So Shannon, are you surprised that Michael Jordan is worried about coming across as a bad guy? No, because Skip, you know Michael, he wanted to make sure his best foot was always forward. If you notice, he never did an interview with him all sweaty. He was always buttoned up. He would get fully dressed. He would put that gold earring in his ear. He would be a suit, shirt, tie. He wanted to make sure he was impeccable. He wanted people to only see that side of him. And then when he was on the court, he was all out. But very few people got an opportunity to get a glimpse at this. Skip, when we talked about this, I think it was a little over six weeks ago about this documentary, I said there's no way that Michael Jordan is going to let all this release Without having some kind of say, without having some kind of say, some kind of approval in what's being out there. That's just the way he is. He likes control. And most people, Skip, when you're doing a documentary about my life, absolutely I'm gonna have some say what gets released. But Skip, I, I think the notion is, is that people tend to think that if you're successful and you're, you're, you're an athlete, everything is he's a choir boy, he's good at two shoes, he didn't hurt anybody, he didn't offend anybody. And that's farthest from the truth. The more accomplished a person is, the more driven they are. And the more they will not only step on you, they will roll over you in order to accomplish their goal and make sure you're, you're in the right frame of mind to help them accomplish that goal, and they will bring you along. So I am not the least surprised, Skip, because Michael Jordan has done everything since he burst onto the scene in 1982, Skip, almost 40 years ago. He's done everything to protect his off the court. Because a lot of this documentary, yes, Skip, we're going to see him on the court, but a lot of this is in the locker room. A lot of this is on plane rides and on the bus and you're going to, in practices, and you're going to get us, and our people will see Michael Jordan in a totally different light. Now, it's not going to change my perception of Michael, but I'm sure some people are like, man, Mike was a nasty mofo. Ooh, Mike was dirty. Oh, I can't believe Mike was like that. Believe it, he was like that, and he should not have to apologize. But Skip, Mike gave you a, a, a kind of glimpse into what he was like at his Hall of Fame speech. Hall of Fame, <laughs> your speech is supposed to skip a celebration, a culmination of the ultimate validation. You're going to your sports heaven. And he took a chance to take a shot at every single person that he feel had wronged him at his speech. So I am not, I am not surprised that Michael uh, uh, is somewhat like, man, how am I going to bet? They're they going to look at me in a totally different light. I'm not surprised by that. So, yes, Skip, I, I'm not surprised, but I'm still anxious to see it, and it's not going to change my perception of him. I'm interested to hear how you, how you feel about it. Okay. I believe that as we speak, Michael Jordan is scared to death that he's going to come across <laughs> as a horrible guy in this documentary even though he had the executive uh, editorial control of this. He signed off on every last inch of the footage that you're about to see in the 10-part documentary. He had total control. But I believe, mm -hmm. deep down, he's saying, I could be damned if I do and damned if I don't. He really wanted this documentary to happen. He needed it to happen right now. We're going to talk deeper about the whys of it a little later in the show. But I'll just give you a glimpse of the whys in my estimation. I believe he does get sick and tired of hearing that LeBron James is the new GOAT. And I believe he gets sick and tired of hearing a lot of times from me, the biggest Michael Jordan fan, that he is the absolute worst general manager, team builder in the history of the NBA, mostly with the Charlotte Hornets. So the point is, he, as he approaches age 60, he's turned 57, he starts thinking, gee, maybe it's time, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on IG, maybe I should do one big epic documentary, but to do so, the the uh, you know sort of the producers involved they're they're all saying well gee Michael we we gotta we gotta be real here and he's trying to be as real as possible 
And I'm trying with you today to be as real as possible. I think there's a double edged sword operating. And yesterday you basically accused me of, hey, you got too close to him in Chicago mm -hmm. and you kind of pulled your punches on him. Well, sometimes maybe I do because I love the guy, but I love the horrible side of him. So today I'm trying to be painfully honest with you. That side of him, there's a side, a big side. He's not a nice guy. What have I told you from the start about LeBron James? <laughs> He's too nice of a guy. So Michael was the ultimate cold-blooded basketball killer. And you're going to see that in this documentary. And on the flip side, LeBron can beat you with his supreme talent, but it's not natural to him. It doesn't come natural to LeBron to be a cold-blooded basketball assassin. That's not his nature. That was Michael's nature. Mm -hmm. So that nature you're going to see behind the scenes, behind closed doors, is the nature that drove the rest of his teammates to try to achieve his level. So, yeah, he got in fistfights in practice with Steve Kerr and Will Perdue of Vanderbilt University. And, yeah, you're going to see in this documentary, he is psychologically just pushing and intimidating <laughs> poor Scott Burrell, who was the 20th overall pick in the 93 draft. And Michael just was all over him every minute to try to live up to being the 20th pick in the first round of the draft. And you're, you're going to see the guy behind closed doors who was – he was a horrible guy in a great way. So that's the side I always embraced. And that's the side that I think a lot of people are going to say, man, that's not the guy I saw in Space Jam in 1996. That, that guy in Space Jam, that was the cartoon superhero who was Michael Jordan. Right. He, he wasn't that behind the scenes. And I've always told you, all the things that I got to see as I, as I was around him through the 98 season, the last dance season, they, they weren't always pretty to watch, but they contributed <laughs> to winning a sixth championship in six tries with six finals MVPs because it takes that horrible side of him to be that great. So to me, I, I do think he's going to sit back because, Shannon, my final point, I'm going to turn it back to you is, Michael Jordan was, was even more protective of his image, even more guarded in his image than LeBron has ever thought about being. Because a lot of times LeBron will curse publicly or he'll do things, he'll get mad at teammates on Twitter between the lines. It's that sort of passive aggressive. He'll do it publicly. And that's not a pretty mm -hmm. sight to me. So he doesn't care that much about his image. But Michael cared about his, seeker, uh, his sneaker selling image probably to a fault. He, Skip, and I think the thing is, is that there's a, a, a public persona of Mike and then there's a private persona. And now that he's allowing the private persona to come out, maybe he's looking back. Did I really have to do it like that? Now, Skip, he's not going to apologize for what he accomplished, but I think sometimes that, Skip, we get to a certain destination, and I, I, I'm, look, I'm not, I, look, I won't preface this. I'm not saying I'm Michael Jordan, but there have been times I look back and wonder if I could have done it differently and got the same results. Um, and, and that's wishful thinking. Now, I don't, I don't regret anything that I've done because I don't know, I'm not necessarily sure that I could have got it to this point without being that way, Skip. I remember when I got to John, John was a great player, and I'm not saying John Elway is, is, is Michael Jordan, but he would say things that he wanted to make sure that Shannon and the other guys was ready Come game time. So he would uh, he would do certain things, not to this. I mean, John wasn't trying to get no quarterbacks at a different level, Skip. They ain't trying to fight anybody. Nobody's really trying to fight the quarterback. But I'm saying great players, they need to make sure. Skip, I wanted to make sure, Skip, when I because come fourth quarter, I need to know who I can count on. So when when Mike asks a question or head coach asks me a question, what play should we call? If I can't get it, well, throw the ball to him because I know he's ready. Well, Michael Jordan says, hold on, I need to, I'm gonna be ready. I need to know, Scotty's going to be ready, but I need to know who else is going to be ready. So I'm going to push buttons come practice time. I'm going to push buttons behind the scene so I'll know who I can count on. Skip, look, when you look at Mike, we think of McDonald's and we think of Gatorade and everybody want to be like Mike. And Mike said, hell, when they see this, they ain't going to want to be like Mike. They're going to like, forget Mike. Yeah. But Skip, he shouldn't worry about that. He should make no concessions. <laughs>
about what he was, because Skip, look, <clears throat> when you, and I think that's what happens, Skip, we have some public people, and when they have frailties behind the scenes and they come out, you're like, I didn't know that he was like that, or I didn't know she was like that. And I think that's what Michael is going through. But in order to tell the story in its totality, he had to put the majority of this out here so we can see. Because it, you don't want to run the risk of having a bunch of stuff and then somebody come back and say, well, this is not all. There was more. So I don't think anybody's going to come back and say, man, because without dry snitching, Mike, man, Mike behind the scenes, he a different breed, Skip. I mean, people don't really get it. Because for the most part, very few people got an opportunity to get a glimpse behind the curtain. But man, Mike, he, Skip, when you say he's a different animal, and when people say he's a different animal, they don't really understand the kind of animal that Mike is. But he was different. And, and another, one more thing, Skip, before I go, if you listen to everybody talk about Michael, you look at Shaq, and you look at all the other great players, they all describe Michael as like a godlike figure. And they say he's like he's levitating. And Skip, that was the first thing I told you when I met him. I could not believe. I'm like, this man is levitating. This is Michael Jordan. And everybody says that I'm, Shaq is a great player, can arguably be a top 10 player, and other great players. That's the mystique. That's the aura behind Michael. And I don't know that, Skip. I don't know if we'll ever see another player that can possess that. Okay, but what I learned in 98 being around him on a daily basis was he fiercely protected that side that you're talking about and the public mm -hmm. didn't see that side and to this day hasn't really seen that side. The first big glimpse came, if you remember, following the first championship season back in 90-91 when my former colleague uh -huh. at the Chicago Tribune, Sam Smith, wrote a book called The Jordan Rules. And it had mm -hmm. a number of behind the scenes glimpses of that guy you're talking about. That guy you could write off as a horrible guy. And Michael mm -hmm. completely dismissed the book. He said, basically, I'll laugh at it, then I'll move on. His teammates all defended him by ripping and shredding the book. And the book was dead on accurate. So that was the first glimpse behind <laughs> the scenes. And, and then from, from there on, he, he does in 96, as I mentioned, he does Space Jam. And everybody went back to thinking, wow, he's a cartoon superhero. He's the nicest guy on the planet. And the first thing <laughs> I noticed in 98 was in, in covering the games is that, to your point, and I think I, I told you this early on, he never missed a trick. He never did an interview sweaty ever after a game, except maybe a quick one with Ahmad Rashad courtside, right. obviously, and is still in his basketball yes, stuff. Yes. But the, at, he, would, he would make us wait for an hour, hour 15, before <laughs> he got completely showered, dressed, got the earring in, got everything perfect so he could present the perfect image to the public. So what always got me was that, that a guy that, that you would think would just own the fact that he was a ruthless competitor, wouldn't own it in public. He did not want the public to see that. Mm -mm. And there was the, mm -mm. the infamous quote, remember, that he reportedly told a friend, Republicans buy sneakers too. So he was completely yeah. apolitical. He didn't want to take a side. He didn't want to take any social mm -hmm. stand. I've always lauded and applauded your man LeBron James for all of his social commentary mm -hmm. and blazing some new trails and taking stands that could cost him advertisers or advertising. And LeBron has guts in, in that realm. And Michael always said, not me, I'm out. I want to sell mm -hmm. more sneakers. And he sold billions of dollars worth of sneakers, as we all know, and they're, they're a great product and they're worthy of buying because I'm wearing them right now. But the, but the point is <laughs> that, that he had to protect his image so you had the duality of cold-blooded killer in reality. That guy who off the court, whew, man, I, I mean, capable of just about anything. And I'm not sure how much of that will be in the documentary to your point. But again, in the public eye, pristine image. And I think he's very nervous right now of gee, I needed this documentary now. I, I needed it in, in large part to show 
the billions of new blind witnesses who think LeBron is the GOAT led by LaShannon Sharp. I need to show them <laughs> what I used to be because that was back in 1998. And <clears throat> that was 22 years ago. As we know, there are a whole lot of people watching our show right now who never saw Michael Jordan saw live. And, and I get it. Nope. But if you didn't see it live, it's hard for you to get it. So he's saying, watch this. But in saying, watch this, is he going to show you too much? Will he alienate some of his fans who will say, I didn't know that. Maybe, maybe he wasn't the nice guy I thought that he was. Nope, he was not. But I personally never thought he was a nice guy to start with. And that's in large part what I love the most about him as a basketball player slash killer. Skip, we, you know, we hear a lot of athletes say that, you know, when they they're have a great game or they have a great, and he's like, you know, one day I'm going to be able to sit back and I'm going to tell my grandkids, well, this is Michael Jordan. He's the old man. You said he's 57. He's the guy. He's about to pop in the tape and, say, and tell all these people, look at what this guy did. Because we hear that all the time. You know, I, I didn't really think about it, but one day I'll be able to tell my kids, I'll be able to tell my grandkids, well, Michael Jordan is about to put a CD in, a DVD, or whatever you want to call it now, and he's about to let the world mm -hmm. see what he did for those that did not get an opportunity to see it up close and personal. And he's also going to take you behind the scene. Skip, even though some people know what's in sausage, and even once they found out how it's made, they still ate it. There's still going to be some people that after they see this, they're still going to love Michael Jordan, and rightfully so. I have no problems with it. Uh, Skip, he was just, like I said, it, you, you got to, Skip, I, I just wish every person in America, in America, Skip, could just be around him one time. I'm talking about just be around him. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not talking about have a conversation, but just get within five, ten feet of him and just look at him, and you will see what everybody else has been saying, Skip, is not real. It is, it is un, it's an unbelievable feeling. And I know, Skip, I know my grandmother's rolling over. She said, boy, you should not have reverence for any man like that. There's only one man you're supposed to have reverence and supposed to look up to. And I understand, Skip, idolatry is, is a no-no. But, Skip, this, is, this man is ridiculous. This man is ridiculous in his aura and his presence. And what made him, and what as pristine, as impeccable, as he was, Skip, you, like you said, yeah, he might stay in courtside with Ahmad and give an interview, but he was not bringing his butt to the podium with a towel draped around his, with a towel draped around his neck, Skip, ice on his knees, shuffling to the podium. That was not Michael Jordan. He was coming with that hoop. Skip, you remember, as a rookie, he used to wear big gold chains. You can put the earring in at the podium, but you're not going to be wearing the gold chain at, uh, in an in, in actual game. But Skip, I am so excited to see this. I would not miss this. It's going to take 10,000 soldiers, an act of Congress, and a calling from God to have me miss this. I would not miss this for all the tea in China. And you know they make a lot of tea in China. But I'm not missing this. I want to see, because like I said, Skip, I know a lot of what happened on the court. As you, because you were there, so you know. But I really want to see some of these bus rides. I mean, you got a little glimpse of it. And when Jerry Reinsdorf told a story about how Michael broke his foot and wanted to come back, and the doctor said there's a 10% chance he could mess it up. If he mess it up again, his career was over. And Jerry Reinsdorf is explaining. He said, Mike, there are 10, tablet, 10 pills. Nine of them would cure your headache. One would kill you. Would you take one? Mike said, well, how bad is the effing headache? That, Skip, do you understand what that man is saying? Do you understand the mindset? Yeah, I would take it. If my headache is hurting so bad, I'm going to roll the dice. Well, every day he got up out of, out of bed. Skip, this man, greatness, greatness drove him. That's the only thing that I can think of, greatness. He wanted to be great. And when you say people like, well, uh, Michael knew. Because Isaiah said 20 games into it, he's going to create another position. Larry Bird called a man Jesus with sneakers. You're talking about two all-time greats. And that's what they were saying about this man early in his career. So they, they saw it coming. The storm was on the horizon. Skip, you know, so, you know forecasting like where there's going to be a storm coming and it's going to be a big one. Well, with the, without technology, just with eyes, that storm is coming. 
and it happened in 1984, mm. and it's going to blow through this league, and we're not going to see anything. Skip, I don't look. We can debate the greatness of the player, but nobody is going to have the aura that this man created. I, it's impossible. It's impossible. So does that mean that right here, right now, live on Undisputed, you're willing to concede that Michael Jeffrey Jordan is the GOAT? Skip, what? Skip, I said the man's aura. I said, you can't take that away from him. You can't take the way the guy played. And then you take it as a chance to try to slide in there. Braun the GOAT. That ain't, I mean, guess what? I'm going to have the same anticipation. 25 years from now, I'll be let me see him, and hopefully my eyesight is good. But if it can't, I hope I can still hear and I can hear about Goat James and the behind the scenes and how ruthless he was. And maybe he put paws on somebody that stepped out of line like your guy. He stole Steve Kerr, too. I hope they show that in the footage where he stole little Stevie Kerr. Little Stevie! Swung on little Stevie. Big Will Purdue, you know, I guess, you know, Will Purdue deserved that. Anybody from Van Vanderbilt deserved to get swung on because he probably stepped out no. of line. But Skip, no. I... <laughs> no. Hey, at least Michael picked close. on somebody's own size with Will Purdue because Will Purdue's seven feet tall, just for the record. Skip, my, LeBron is not like that. LeBron is not one of those guys that's trying to... LeBron is like, we, we, we trying to bring people together. That's what we do. We're going to bring us together. Mm -hmm. Skip, there's, there's different ways to lead now. Yeah. I don't want to see that. You go with that. See, this is why I get him. I, I've been praising Mike because he's historically and generational. He's 10 generational great. And there now you try to take a swipe at LeBron. I'm not going to let you do that, Skip. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe here to get the latest from the show. And be sure to check out more of the best clips from Undisputed or go watch a few other segments from our other shows on FS1.